Welcome to the new lecture on Bio 110. This lecture will be used during the days of October 8 and October 10, part 2 and part 3 of the energy transformation in mitochondria and chloroplast. So a review from the last lecture, and we covered in the last lecture, was the idea that the electron transfer proteins are used to pump protons across the inner membrane of the mitochondria, that the proton concentration and inner mitochondrial membrane potential create the proton motile force, and we're going to review those topics again today. That proton motile force is going to drive the synthesis of ATP, and we're going to look at the mechanics of ATP synthesis. And that ATP synthase is a molecular rotational motor that is going to use the proton motile force to turn around to generate ATP. Last, that redox potentials as a measure of electron affinities, and we're going to reinforce those subjects today. As a way to review, we're going to look at the energy harvesting systems in the cell. As we discussed, proteins in the inner membrane of the mitochondria will be able to have redox reactions to pass electrons from one member of the protein complex to another. The energy of those electrons are going to be used to allow the transport of protons from the mitochondrial matrix to the mitochondrial intermembrane space that will generate an electrochemical gradient for protons, and that electrochemical gradient of protons will be used by the enzyme ATP synthase to generate ATP. So the first stage of this reaction will be for the energy of the electron transport to be used to pump protons across the membrane. The second stage of this process will involve the energy in the proton gradient to be harnessed by ATP synthase to make ATP. That is the concept of chemi-osmotic coupling, the linking of chemical bonds formation to membrane transport proteins. When we look at the proton motile force, the proton motile force, which is another name for the electrochemical gradient of protons, it is a combination of the membrane potential as well as the pH gradient across the inner mitochondrial membrane. As indicated by this figure, the proton motile force uh, involves a pH gradient that will be the chemical component of the electrochemical gradient. So you will have a pH of 7.2 in the intermembrane space and a greater pH of 7.9 in the matrix of the mitochondria. That is here, the strength of that pH gradient is illustrated here by the green arrow. On the other hand, the proton motile force is going to use the membrane potential. So the membrane potential is going to be the differential charges across the inner mitochondrial membrane, being positive in the outside and negative in the inside. That membrane potential will have a great influence in the proton motile force, as indicated here by the red arrow. The electrochemical gradient of those protons will be the combination of the membrane potential as well as the pH gradient. So now, this brings us to the point of chemiosmosis. The energy from electron transfer is going to be used to pump protons across the membrane. Now, that is going to create the electrochemical gradient of protons across the inner membrane of the mitochondria. That energy of the electrochemical gradient of protons will then be used to power the ATP synthase which use three protons to generate one ATP molecule. The cell will use the energy release in the redox reactions of the electron transport chain to create the gradient, which has potential energy, therefore the proton motile force. The protein involved in this system is going to be the ATP synthase, and the ATP synthase has two different subunits with different functions. One subunit, which is the rotor, is the F0 subunit. That part involves a rotor ring, shown over here in light blue, as well as a central stock that has an uh, invagination that allows it to move inside the ATP synthase head, which is the F1 subunit. The other part of the component, it's the component that is stationary, and that is the F1 ATP ACE head that has a stock shown over here in orange, and a set of globular proteins, three subunits of two, that form the ATPase head. As the central stock rotates 
caused by the movement of protons across the membrane that is going to allow for the rotation of the central stock. The kinetic energy that is generated by the rotation of the central stock will be imparted to the F1 ATPase head, catalyzing the reaction of ADP and inorganic phosphate to create an ATP molecule. Here on the right, what we have are the ribbon images of the same protein, showing the F0 rotor, as well as the central stock, as well as the F1 ATPase heads combined, as you can see, is made of two different proteins, one that is dark green and one that is light green. So there are three darker green subunits and three lighter green subunits, and those combined will make the F1 ATPS head, which we call the stator. So the ATP synthesis, it's a molecule that is able to rotate in different directions depending on the need of the protein. For ATP synthase, it's using the proton gradient to generate ATP. So as you can see from this image, the protons are moving to the left of the protein, coming out on the right-hand side, and the kinetic energy generated by the gradient of protons shuttling across the molecule, it's going to be transformed into chemical energy, generating ATP. However, the molecule is also able to hydrolyze ATP and by hydrolyzing ATP, it's able to pump protons against their concentration gradient, working as a proton pump. What are you going to see now? It's a short film describing the role of the ATP synthase. ATP synthase is a molecular machine that works like a turbine to convert the energy stored in a proton gradient into chemical energy stored in the bond energy of ATP. The flow of protons down their electrochemical gradient drives a rotor that lies in the membrane. It is thought that protons flow through an entry open to one side of the membrane and bind to rotor subunits. Only protonated subunits can then rotate into the membrane, away from the static channel assembly. Once the protonated subunits have completed an almost full circle and have returned to the static subunits, an exit channel allows them to leave to the other side of the membrane. In this way, the energy stored in the proton gradient is converted into mechanical rotational energy. The rotational energy is transmitted via a shaft attached to the rotor that penetrates deep into the center of the characteristic lollipop head, the F1 ATPase, which catalyzes the formation of ATP. The F1 ATPase portion of ATP synthase has been crystallized. Its molecular structure shows that the position of the central shaft influences the conformation and arrangement of the surrounding subunits. It is these changes that drive the synthesis of ATP from ADP. In this animated model, different conformational states are lined up as a temporal sequence as they would occur during rotation of the central shaft. Like any enzyme, ATP synthase can work in either direction. If the concentration of ATP is high and the proton gradient low, ATP synthase will run in reverse, hydrolyzing ATP as it pumps protons across the membrane. To show the rotation of the central shaft, a short fluorescent actin filament was experimentally attached to it. Single filaments attached to single F1 ATPases can be visualized in the microscope. When ATP is added, the filament starts spinning, 
directly demonstrating the mechanical properties of this remarkable molecular machine. So now, let's look at some of the proteins that are involved in the transport of some of the intermediates inside the mitochondrial membrane. Here in this image, we have an extract of the inner mitochondrial membrane as well as the outer mitochondrial membrane. In the middle, you can see that you have a proton concentration gradient, having a higher concentration of protons in the intermembrane space and a low concentration of protons in the matrix. This also causes a membrane electropotential, being more positive in the outside of the inner membrane and more negative in the inner portion of the inner membrane. Now, protons are translocated across the membrane during electron transport by the subunits of the electron transport chain. Eventually, in the outer membrane, protons can find hadronium ions that can also form water molecules. But in order to make ATP, you need phosphate. And phosphate can come from the cytoplasm of the cell, it can translocate across the outer mitochondrial membrane through a porin, and then it needs to be translocated across the inner membrane of the mitochondria by a phosphate transporter. The phosphate transporter will allow for the import of phosphate with the concomitant exit of the hydronium ions. ADP needs to come inside the matrix of the mitochondria, whereas ATP needs to be exported outside for the cell to use. That is mediated by an ADP-ATP antiporter molecule. Last but not least, what we have is the generation of ATP. The ATP synthase is going to use the proton gradient that is going to have a greater concentration in the intermembrane space to generate ATP from the subunits of ADP and phosphate, generating ATP and a hydronium ion. Now the protomodal force also could be used to power the transport of pyruvate, phosphate, and ATP. For example, pyruvate generated through glycolysis will diffuse across the membrane through a pouring molecule, so it will be an inorganic phosphate. Now, pyruvate being a charged molecule, it's impermeable to the inner membrane. So the proton gradient can be used to import pyruvate inside the matrix of the mitochondria to a pyruvate proton symporter. The phosphate coming inside can also be transported across the membrane through utilizing the pH gradient to a phosphate importer that is also going to allow the import of protons in the membrane. To import ADP, you can use a voltage gradient to drive ATP and ADP exchange. So the voltage gradient would allow the movement of ATP to the outside of the fill with a concomitant transport of ADP inside the matrix. As I mentioned, pyruvate enters the cell through facilitated diffusion from porins that are present in the outer membrane of the mitochondria. So what are the molecular mechanisms that occur during electrons transport? And how does the electron transport result in the generation of a proton gradient that can drive ATP synthesis? So let's review some of the points about how electrons and protons are moved from different molecules. In the upper part of this figure, what we have is an oxidized electron carrier X. That molecule will be able to accept an electron and go through a transient negatively charged intermediate. That transient negatively charged intermediate will be able to take a proton from water therefore becoming completely reduced as a molecule with a proton attached to it. So here shown as X with the proton. Now, the opposite reaction can also happen. In the opposite reaction, you have the reduced uh, electron carrier containing the proton that is going to donate an electron to another molecule that is going to uh, accept it and be reduced and you generate a transient molecule with a positive charge. Now, that transient protonated molecule is able to donate that proton to form a water molecule and therefore be completely transformed into an oxidized electron carrier. So a redox reaction 
will involve the concomitant acceptance of electrons and donation of electrons, but also of protons. So let's take a look at a simplified electron transport chain. In this simplified electron transport chain, we have three different complexes of molecules interacting with one another. Molecule A, Molecule B, and Molecule C. Molecule A has a high energy electron and is going to be able to donate that high energy electron to complex B. Complex B is going to be undergoing that slightly negative charge intermediate and therefore it's going to be able to remove a proton from a water molecule. Now, shown here in the middle, you have complex B with the electron and that proton. Now you have protein C which is another electron carrier and it's one in which it's going to be reduced and receive an electron. So complex B is going to donate its electron to complex C. By doing so it's going to generate that intermediate that has a positively charged proton attached to it. That intermediate can now uh, donate the proton to form a water molecule and at the same time donate the electron that low energy electron now to molecule C. So what you can appreciate is that you went from complex A that has a high energy electron all the way down to molecule C that has a low energy electron and the energy change in this electron was used to pump a proton molecule from the outside of the membrane to the inside of the membrane region. As an electron is passing along the electron transport chain, it can bind and release a protein at each step. And therefore, you're going to have a change in free energy that is going to be negative, indicating that the transport of electrons is energetically favorable. Let's take a moment to look more closely at redox potentials. What I have in this image is called the reduction potential tower. And the reduction potential tower, it's, has this, it's a way to visualize all the molecules involved, for example, in respiration or photosynthesis. You can have it for any kind of um, redox reaction complex uh, or setup. And it's basically putting the molecules in order of their redox potential. The more negative the redox potential, the better that molecule is at donating electrons. So as you know, electron donors have a high potential energy and release that energy when they're releasing their electrons. So some of that energy, as I mentioned a moment ago, can be used to transfer protons across the membrane. But some of that energy can also be used and lost as heat. But the electrons are going to keep moving uh, down to other electron acceptors until they get to an electron acceptor. So in the case of respiration, you can have, for example, a substrate like sugar that is going to donate its electrons to generate NADH. In the complex one of the NADH oxidoreductase, you have now flavor proteins, iron sulfur proteins, and quinones, which are going to accept the electrons. Notice that every molecule in this step has a more positive redox potential, making it a better electron acceptor than the molecule preceding it. So the redox potential of NADH is minus 0 0.3, and the redox potential of, let's say, quinone it looks like it's minus 0 0.02. Therefore, the quinone molecule is a much greater electron acceptor than the NADH molecule, and the NADH molecule is a much greater electron donor than the quinone. But since the molecules in the electron transport chain are arranged according to the redox potential, what you can see is that each member of the electron transport chain, it's going to be donating its electrons to another molecule with a more positive redox potential. At the end, the ultimate electron acceptor in respiration is going to be oxygen, with a redox potential of 0 0.8. Also notice 
the units used in redox potential is using units of volts and in a moment we're going to see how the redox potential is calculated and how this voltage is being determined so one of the things that we want to understand is how we can measure the ability of a molecule to either donate or accept the electrons and that is mediated through an experiment in which you can put an equimolar concentration of a molecule, in this case molecule A, in a flask together with an equal amount of that molecule that is oxidized. So you have, let's say, one mole of the molecule in its reduced state and one mole of the molecule in its oxidized state. That is what you call the sample half cell. On another flask, you're going to have what is called the reference half cell. The reference half cell has one mole of protons as mole as well, excuse me, as hydrogen gas to one atmosphere. The voltage redox potential of that one mole of protons as well as hydrogen gas is considered arbitrarily to be zero. So once you connect the two flasks by a salt bridge, which allows the transfer of electrons, you also then can measure the voltage that is moving across from one of the half cells to the other one. The redox potential is going to be a measure of electron affinities. So we're going to take a look at how the electrons are moving from one half cell to the next. If the electrons move from the reference half cell all the way down to the sample half cell, we then think that's going to measure a positive voltage indicating that the molecules in the sample half cell are able to accept electrons. On the other hand, if the electrons flow from the sample half cells to the reference half cell, that means that the molecules in the sample half cells are good electron donors and therefore the electrons are now free to move from the sample half cell all the way down to the reference half cell. That is going to give you the direction of the standard redox potential, which is seen as E prime naught. So for example, you always measure a redox pair. Here we have an example of NADH and NAD+. So if you were to write the reaction in as a chemical equation, NADH, the arrows back and forth, is going to be equal to NAD+, plus, plus a proton, plus two electrons. That reaction is going to have a standard redox potential of minus 320 millivolts. The same reaction now check for the exchange of electrons between reduced ubiquinone and oxidized ubiquinone plus two protons and two electrons is going to have a standard redox potential of 30 millivolts. Reduced cytochrome C to oxidized cytochrome C and one electron is going to have a standard redox potential of 230 millivolts. And last, the breaking of water into oxygen and protons and two electrons is going to have a standard redox potential of 820 millivolts. When we look at the molecules, molecules with low redox potentials, meaning that is uh, really negative, they tend to be really good electron donors. Whereas molecules with high redox potential, assuming that is more positive, tend to have a tendency to accept electrons. So you will always compare two molecules and look at the standard redox potential. The one with the more positive standard redox potential will be the electron acceptor and the one with the more negative standard electron redox potential is going to be the electron donor. Let's take a moment to observe that as a real example using ubiquinone and NADH. So here we have the experiment where we had set up a one-to-one equimolar concentration mixture 
of NADH and NAD+. On the other flask, we have a one-to-one -one mixture of oxidized and reduced ubiquinone. We put the salt bridge connecting the two samples and we measure the change in voltage. So we can then look and calculate the change in redox potential from that acceptor to that donor. And that can be done really simple by looking at the redox potential of the acceptor molecules minus the redox potential of the donor molecule. From the previous table, we see that the redox potential of ubiquinone is 30 millivolts and the redox potential of NADH is minus 320 millivolts. When we plug those two numbers in our equation, the change in redox potential from the acceptor, 30 millivolts of euquinone, minus the minus 320 of the electron donor, which is NADH, is going to be equal to a positive 320 millivolts in redox potential change. We can use that redox potential to calculate the delta G naught of the redox reaction. So we can use the formula delta G it's going to be equal to minus small n multiplied by 0 0.023 multiplied that by the change in redox potential, where little n is going to be the number of electrons transferred across the redox potential change. What we have here in the middle it's the value of 0 0.023, which is the Faraday constant. And even though it's not shown in this image, that has also units. And the units for this particular Faraday constant are going to be 0 0.023 kilocalories per mole, um, but also in the denominator multiplied by millivolts. So if you were to evaluate the change in free energy when NADH donates one electron to ubiquinone, we will have to multiply minus 1, so it's going to be the number of electrons being transferred, times 0 0.023 kilocalories per mole per millivolt, multiply that by the change in redox potential, and that's going to be equal to minus 8 kilocalories per mole. So what we see is that a... let me put this down here... that the more positive change in redox potential we have, like in this case of plus 350 millivolts, the more negative the delta G is going to be. And that, in this case, came out to be minus 8.0 kilocalories per mole. So in a spontaneous reaction, the electrons are donated by the half reaction with the more negative redox potential and are accepted by the half reaction with the more positive redox potential. So that is going to help you to um, determine which is going to be the electron acceptor and which is going to be the electron donor. One thing that I would like to remind you is that the Faraday constant can be used with different units. So be careful when you see this equation with a different value instead of seeing the value of 0 0.023 uh, and that is kilocalories per mole per millivolt because in other Faraday equations they could be using kilojoules per mole and volts instead of millivolts. So again, pay attention to the units that you're going to be given in the Faraday constant. Just to reinforce, the change in redox potential is going to be the difference in redox potential between the two redox pairs, always subtracting the redox potential of the acceptor by the redox potential of the donor. Let's take a small moment to look at a little bit more carefully at the electron carriers that are going to also form and be part of the electron pumps. As we discussed in lecture, I'm going to bring another part here. There we go. I'm going to bring that up. As we discussed in lecture, um, 
the electrons that have been harvested and saved in NADH will be donated to the NADH dehydrogenase complex. NADH carries two electrons and those two electrons will be donated to the NADH dehydrogenase complex. To remind you that this is a complex of multiple proteins, I'm putting over here the statement showing that you have at least 44 different proteins involved in the NADH dehydrogenase complex, but you also have molecules with prosthetic groups. And we're going to take a moment later to look at that. Now, in reality, per NADH molecule passing through, you're going to get the pumping of four protons across the membrane by the NADH dehydrogenase complex. As I mentioned to you earlier, the succinate coenzyme Q reductase, it's an enzyme, which is the succinase dehydrogenase, which is part of the citric acid cycle, and is the only enzyme that is membrane-bound in the citric acid cycle. It participates both in the citric acid cycle as well as the electron transport chain. When succinate it's oxidized into fumarate, it's going to donate its electron to FAD, generating FADH2. FADH2 is then able to donate its electrons directly to ubiquinone, and ubiquinone will accept those two electrons, becoming ubiquinol. As we have mentioned also earlier, the ubiquinone molecule is a soluble hydrophobic molecule that is able to shuttle electrons between the NADH dehydrogenase complex to the cytochrome C reductase complex. But it can also be used to get electrons from FADH2 into the system. Notice that there is no transfer of protons across this uh, succinate coenzyme Q reductase. For your own um, amusement, I will let you know that you have a complex of four proteins that um, compose the succinate coenzyme Q reductase system. Now, ubiquinone, as I mentioned, is a soluble electron carrier that can shuttle back and forth electrons between the two complexes. Now, the ubiquinone is able to donate its two electrons to the cytochrome C reductase complex. So as I mentioned earlier, the ubiquinone is able to transfer its electrons to the cytochrome C reductase complex. An interesting uh, feature of the cytochrome C reductase complex is that it is an unbalanced proton pump. It is able to take the two protons of the ubiquinone molecules through a series of reactions that are called the Q cycle, and we're not going to have the chance to look at those carefully, but the electrons that are given by the ubiquinone are going to allow the pumping of four protons outside in the intermembrane space. So two protons will come inside the system and four are going to come out, and that's the reason why it is called an unbalanced proton pump. Now, between the cytochrome C reductase complex and the cytochrome C oxidase complex, you have cytochrome C as an electron carrier. Its cytochrome C is able to shuttle one electron between the two complexes, and it is at the cytochrome C oxidase complex where oxygen is going to be ultimately reduced to generate water. In the process of the electron transfer, two protons are going to be pumped across the membrane into the intermembrane space. Now, as I mentioned to you earlier, you have electron donors and electron recipients that have different redox potentials. And this image here, it is organizing the molecules in the electron transport chain according to the redox potential. So the best donor in the system is NADH with a highly negative redox potential. That molecule will be able to donate its electrons to the NADH dehydrogenase complex. We have a redox potential of around negative 200 millivolts. The ubiquinones are going to have a redox potential that is even more positive than the NADH dehydrogenase enzyme and therefore will be able to accept their electrons.
so making it a better electron acceptor. The next molecule would be the cytochrome C reductase complex, and as you can see, the molecules present in this complex have an even more positive redox potential in millivolts. Cytochrome C has an even more positive redox potential than the cytochrome C reductase complex, and it therefore it's able to accept the electrons from the cytochrome C reductase complex. At the end, they are able to transfer those electrons to the cytochrome C oxidase complex, which has an even more positive redox potential. Last, you have water accepting the electrons from the, from the cytochrome oxidase complex, generating a water molecule. FADH2 is able to donate its electrons to the ubiquinone, and it has a slightly more negative um, redox potential. What you can appreciate in this image is also that is the difference in redox potential. It's not really the spatial arrangement of the molecules causes the electron flow sequentially from one carrier to the another. So the donor of electron always has a more negative redox potential than the molecule that is accepting those electrons. And therefore, since the donor also ha always has a more negative redox potential than the molecule accepting the electrons, the movement of electrons down the electron transport chain is basically unidirectional. A molecule like ubiquinone will not be able to donate its electrons back to the NADH dehydrogenase complex because the NADH dehydrogenase complex has a more negative redox potential than ubiquinone, making it a really poor electron acceptor from ubiquinone. So all waste electrons are moved from a molecule with a really high negative redox potential to another molecule with a more positive redox potential. When we look at some of these molecules now in combination, we can see the spatial arrangement. So in the membrane, you have the complex one, which is the where NADH is going to be oxidized to NAD+. The complex 2, which is not shown on the book, but I have included multiple times in the slides, is the one in which the electrons from succinate will be given to FAD and therefore generating FADH. And then the electrons from FADH can be given directly to the quinone molecule. That quinone molecule with electrons shown over here as QH2 is able now to bring those electrons to the complex 3. Complex 3 will put the electrons to go across multiple different subunits, shown over here by the uh, Bl to BH or Bl to the iron sulfur molecule to C1. So those are the names of different uh, cytochrome molecules within this complex. And they eventually will be able to donate the electrons to cytochrome C, which is another mobile electron carrier, but this time this is a protein. Different from ubiquinone, ubiquinone it's not a protein. We're going to look at that in a moment. At the end, the cytochrome C um, molecule is able to pass its electrons to the cytochrome C oxidative complex, which is the very last one. And here is where the electrons will be passed eventually down to oxygen, which is the ultimate electron acceptor. That is going to make oxygen to be reduced to water. In eukaryotic cells, like the ones that we're studying in class, this process happens exclusively in the mitochondria. Protons will be pumped by complex 1, complex 3, and complex 4, generating a proton motile force, which is the same thing as a proton electrochemical gradient. That also is going to induce the polarization of the inner membrane of the mitochondria with more positive charges in the outside looking at the, at the periplasm region or the, um, in, in, sorry, not the periplasm region because this is not a bacteria, looking at the intermembrane space and a more negative environment within the matrix of the mitochondria. This image here 
compares the electron transport chain and chemiosmosis uh, systems in eukaryotes and prokaryotes. As we have learned, the membrane shown over here, it's the inner membrane and the intermembrane space of the mitochondria. In bacteria, however, this is the plasma membrane as well as the periplasmic region or the region between the inner membrane and the cell wall of gram-negative bacteria. So what you find are similar molecules, complex 1, complex 2, complex 3, and complex 4. And complex 1 is where you will have NADH donating its electrons and that complex serves as a proton pump to bring in protons into the intermembrane space or the periplasm of the bacteria. The NADH can come, in the case of bacteria, from glycolysis, the Krebs cycle, of any other pathway that generates NADH. Eventually, the electrons go into the coenzyme Q or the ubiquinone pool. That is the also the place in which the FADH2 that is being generated in reaction 6 from the Krebs cycle will be able to donate these electrons down into the quinone pool. Quinones, the coenzyme Q, it's able now to shuttle the electrons from complex 1 to complex 3, where the cytochrome B system will be able to accept them, use that energy to pump protons across, and eventually the cytochrome C1 system will be able to pass those protons to a cytochrome molecule. Its cytochrome molecule is able to carry one electron down to the cytochrome oxidase uh, complex that is going to be the place where water will be generated by the reduction of oxygen. Protons will also be pumped through this system to en enrich the proton model force being generated in the intermembrane space. Those protons will be used by those proton, that proton gradient will be used by ATP synthase to generate energy in the form of ATP. So now when we look at microorganisms, and this could be a tricky question, we can see the following. So we're looking at aerobic respiration. So glycolysis is going to take a glucose molecule to NAD+, to ATP, those are the ones that are going to be used to the initial uh, input of energy into the system. And eventually you're going to oxidize the glucose molecule into two pyruvate molecules for ATP and two NADHs. You're also going to get to ADP. Pyruvate will go into the citric acid cycle and the NADH is going to donate those electrons to complex one of respiration. Now, let's look at how many ATP that is going to generate. It is understood that for one NADH molecule, you can generate three ATP. So, two NADH molecules generated in glycolysis are going to help generate six ATPs. At the end, what we have is the generation also of two ATPs in glycolysis. So from glycolysis and the oxidative phosphorylation of NADH, we get a total of 8 ATP. Now let's put together the citric acid cycle with the dehydrogenation of pyruvate. So we have a pyruvate molecule, four NAD plus molecules, a GDP, and an FAD molecule. That was going to lead to the complete oxidation of pyruvate into three CO2 molecules, also in generating four NADH molecules, one FADH2 plus one GTP molecule. The NADH are going to go donate its electrons to complex one of the electron transport chain, and the FADH2 is going to donate those electrons to complex two, the ubiquinone system. So one more time, looking at phosphate, a uh, substrate level phosphorylation, uh, that GTP that is GTP, excuse me, that is being generated in the Krebs cycle can be used to generate one ATP. From the oxidative phosphorylation, 
one FADH2 molecule will generate two ATP. One NADH molecule can generate three ATP, but because we have four, we can count them being 12. Therefore, from the citric acid cycle, we are going to generate a total of 15 ATP. Since this is only from one pyruvate molecule. Since we have two pyruvate molecules, we can count in generating 30 ATP. So this is the estimation that from one glucose molecules undergoing oxidation through respiration, you're going to obtain 38 ATP molecules from one glucose. This may be a little bit different when we are looking at eukaryotic cells because biochemically speaking, uh, we are rounded up the uh, number of ATP generated. It is thought that an NADH molecule can produce two and a half ATPs and an FADH2 molecule can generate one and a half ATP. But we're also going to use the ATP in eukaryotes to help us transfer some of the molecules across membranes. So you're going to require some of those protons that are going to be used to induce phosphorylation to contribute to the movement. But for now, for our purpose, I'm going to assume no, no ATP loss and that you generate a total of 38 ATP per glucose molecules. Let's look at another question. Let's look at how the structure of the electron transfer proteins and molecules is going to facilitate their ability to shuttle electrons in the mitochondrial membrane. For that, let's take a moment and look at our first molecule, ubiquinone. So ubiquinone it's an electron carrier, and this is one of the few electron carriers that is actually not a protein. Ubiquinone is also called coenzyme Q or coenzyme Q10. Look at a lot of the um, cosmetic products, they will actually say that you can have coenzyme Q10. The Q10 comes from the number of isoprenal subunits that make the hydrophobic region of the ubiquinone molecule. This one has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten isoprenal subunits. Some other ubiquinones may have less. Now, in the head of the ubiquinone, you have two carbonyl groups where carbon has a double bond with oxygen. Accepting one, subsequently acceptance of one electron and a proton, it's going to turn ubiquinone into ubiquinol, where each of this oxygen, instead of being part of a carbonyl group, it's now part of an hydroxyl group, this alcohol group. So when ubiquinone, uh, ubiquinol, excuse me, or you can also look at it at QH2, donate these electrons, it can do it sequentially to go back into being ubiquinone with the carbon double bond to, to the oxygen. So ubiquinone is an organic molecule and it's dissolved in the hydrophobic region of the inner membrane of the mitochondrion. It is free to, the, to move within the hydrophobic region of the membrane by diffusion. It is not able to cross the hydrophobic Philic region and therefore it always stays within the hydrophobic region of the membrane. So it cannot diffuse across the membrane, only through the membrane. The other molecule that is uh, an electron carrier is cytochrome C. Cytochrome C is a protein that contains a heme prosthetic group. A, post a prosthetic group is a small non-peptide organic molecule or made an ion or metal ion that is tightly and specifically associated with a protein complexes. For example, hemoglobin has heme and the heme in hemoglobin is also a prosthetic group. In this case, the heme units in cytochrome C are the prosthetic groups of the cytochrome molecule. The cytochrome molecule has one heme prosthetic group that in the middle of it has an iron atom that is the one that is going to be able to accept the electrons. Usually iron in the heme prosthetic group is found as the ferric ion which is the iron plus three. 
you will be able to accept one electron to become the ferrous ion of iron, which is iron plus two. So that's one of the main reasons why a cytochrome C molecule is only able to accept one electron. So here we have an image of the prosthetic group. The heme group is connected to the protein portion by um, sulfate bonds over here. And the iron inside, it's being trapped by a cage of nitrogens in the middle. And that is going to allow this iron plus three to become iris plus two when it is reduced. This table, um, it's showing a lot of the electron carrier complexes and the prosthetic groups that are required for respiration. Every one of the complexes involved in electron transport chain has molecules with prosthetic group. So for example, um, complex one, it's going to have a flaving mononucleotide and it's going to have iron sulfur molecules that are going to be able to accept electrons. So complex two, which is the succinate dehydrogenase, it's going to be able to have the FAD molecule that it will accept electrons to become FAD plus and then be able to transfer those to an iron sulfur molecule. In complex three, you have heme BL, heme BH, iron sulfur molecules, and heme C1. Those will be the prosthetic groups that will be able to accept electrons in the complex three. In the cytochrome C protein, you have a heme C, and in the cytochrome C oxidase, which is the last complex, complex four, you have copper ions, you have heme A, him A3, as well as a copper B ion as well. One of the things that I want you to pay attention is that the name of the complexes in this image is changed from the one used in our book. And that is something for you to keep in mind because, for example, in an exam like the MCAT, they may use a bunch of, they may use any of the names by which the NADH reductase complex it's known. So they can say NADH coenzyme CoQ reductase, they can call it complex one, or they can call it NADH dehydrogenase. So depending on the system, make sure that you uh, remember which one of the complexes is the one in which NADH will donate its electrons. Here is an example of a dimeric iron sulfur cluster protein. This protein has a prosthetic group which is an iron sulfur. So when you see this protein it has two different polypeptides, one shown in cyan and one shown in green, and those are complex with iron sulfur, iron sulfur clusters. The iron molecule is shown in brown and the sulfur molecule is shown in yellow. So those will be the prosthetic groups that will accept the electrons during the electron transport chain. So let's look at what is happening in the cytochrome oxidase complex when it receives electrons from cytochrome C. At the beginning, we're going to have those electrons coming from cytochrome C. Those electrons are going to be harvested in the complex and wait until all four electrons arrive. Each of them is coming in by a cytochrome C which only can carry one electron. So if you take a look at the component over here, you're going to have a copper ions which are going to be able to help accept. Here in green are the protein side chains and you have the heme A molecule as well as the heme A3 molecule. So Inside the heme A3 and the heme A molecule, you have iron atoms that are going to accept the electrons. So the first electron acceptor is going to be the copper molecules. The second set of electron acceptors are going to be the heme A molecules. And the other uh, electron acceptors are going to be the heme A3 molecules and last, the other copper molecules. 
So in there, in this system, you're going to collect four different electrons because oxygen as gas, uh, molecular oxygen, is going to be require four electrons and four protons to be completely reduced into two molecules of water. So part of the issue that this is done is because if you can take one electron alone into an ox uh, into molecular oxygen, that will generate a superoxide radical, and the superoxide radical is very damaging to the cell. Therefore, uh, the ox the electrons are held in place until all four of them are present to allow the conversion of one molecular oxygen molecule to two water molecules. This could be illustrated in the next movie. The mitochondrion is the site of most of the cell's energy production. After food molecules are processed in the cytosol, they enter the mitochondrion, where they are further broken down. In the citric acid cycle, the molecules are stripped of high-energy electrons, which are donated to carrier molecules, such as NADH. The carrier molecules transfer the high-energy electrons to a chain of proteins called the electron transport chain, which is embedded in the inner mitochondrial membrane. The chain acts as a pump, using the energy of the electrons to move protons from one side of the membrane to the other. The pumping creates a proton gradient across the membrane, which the mitochondrion can tap to make the fuel molecule ATP. The electron transfer begins at a multiprotein complex called the NADH dehydrogenase complex. This complex has a higher affinity for electrons than NADH and easily strips away the high energy electrons. As the electrons are transferred from one protein to another in the complex, energy is released and used to pump protons across the membrane. Electrons are then transferred to ubiquinone, a different carrier that shuttles them to the next way station called the cytochrome BC1 complex, which again pumps protons as they flow through it. Because each complex in the chain has a higher affinity for the electrons than the previous one, the electrons keep moving through the chain unidirectionally. Finally, cytochrome C delivers the electrons to the cytochrome oxidase complex, a third proton pump. The cycle repeats until the cytochrome oxidase complex has accumulated four electrons. From there, they are handed over to molecular oxygen. Oxygen takes up the electrons as it combines with protons, forming water as a product, thereby completing the stepwise path of the combustion of the food molecules. So at the end, this entire electron transport chain system can be summarized in through a series of redox reactions from a molecule with a really high negative redox potential, NADH, donating its electrons to a complex with a more positive redox potential that will accept those electrons and the electron the energy from those electrons are is going to be used to pump protons across the inner mitochondrial membrane into the uh, intermembrane space mobile electron carriers will be able to move the electrons from one complex of the electron transport chain to the next one and again the reason why this happens is because the um, redox potential of the next molecule is a little bit more positive eventually the electrons are going to go through three different electron transport chain complexes and each of them is able to use the energy of those electrons to pump protons across the membrane. Molecular oxygen will be the ultimate electron acceptor generating a water molecule when it is reduced. The proton motile force generated by the transfer of electrons across the inner mitochondrial membrane will be used to power the ATP synthase which it will be able to catalyze the reaction of ADP and phosphate to generate ATP. That concludes this lecture. This is the one lecture that we're going to be using for the next two classes. So 
If you have any questions, please post it in the discussion forum and I will see you on Wednesday.